Okay. I want to appreciate you all coming here. And uh, what I want I want to go through several things. But the first thing I want to go through is to locate uh, where we are uh, this day, the 25th of August, 2018. Okay, so, and then the second part, I want to go through looking at yourself from the standpoint of an older, from the standpoint of the European aristocracy. How do they see you? It's very important. You need to know how they look at you and how they see the rest of, of humanity. Because, this, because this, is, this is the issue that we're dealing with. This is a, one of the critical issues that we're dealing with. And the third thing I want to focus on is uh, how things are playing out inside the United States and, and what the potentials are uh, for victory in the United States. So the first thing is that you have a breakdown of the financial system currently into both economic and financial warfare against the nations associated with the Belt and Road, Russia, China, and all the significant nations uh, globally that are, that are leaning in the direction of the Belt and Road. There's economic and financial warfare. I distinguish between financial warfare and economic warfare. Uh, uh, they're the same, but they're two different. I'm, I'm just making a distinction, okay? Financial warfare involves financial attacks, and economic warfare primarily involves, at this time, sanctions. Economic warfare is being conducted in the form of sanctions against Russia, Iran, North Korea, and sanctions being threatened against other nations uh, who might do, do business with those nations, as well as those nations trading with these nations. Uh, these sanctions disrupt the potential of bringing a coordinated development in such areas. In North Korea, it brings, uh, it, brings uh, uh, it disrupts the potential to coordinate the North Asian area, which includes Japan, South, uh, the Koreas, Russia, and China. In the case of, 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 of sanctions against Russia, it, it prevents or retards the ability of the of, of the uh, European Euro nations of Europe to integrate economically with Eurasia and Russia. That's that's what that what that's all about. Okay. In the case of Iran, it's the same thing, but it also has uh, a, an aspect of of disrupting the ability to coordinate the development of that whole region with the Belt and Road coming to Iran through Turkey into Europe you know, through Pakistan, through India, through Pakistan, and to Europe. So, all these, so what, so do not, do not blame President Trump personally for this. This is, this is embedded in the system of how the system works. And if, and if all of you were to have watched the, um, the recommendation to watch the spider web, uh, Britain's second, Empire, you will get a sense of what it, what all of this is protecting. It's protecting that, the, the protecting the offshore speculative financial system centered in secrecy jurisdictions, which all tie into the city of London. Um, and so, so now, like you have, um, like you have a situation. Where new sanctions took effect, I think a few days ago, on Russia, uh, allegedly through because of the Scripple affair, allegedly because of the Scripple affair. So these, these, the Scripple affair and all these, all these aligning attacks on Russia are not, uh, are not. Nobody believes they're, nobody believes they're true. They're, they're an, they're a. Uh, pretext only. They are pretexts only for economic warfare. That's all they are. Okay. And the new sanctions that are, that are going into effect have frozen uh, 500 million dollars worth of Russian accounts 
in U.S. Um, U.S. banks. Five hundred million dollars, yeah, in U.S. banks. Now, also something similar has gone on with Credit Suisse, where they have put five billion dollars of Russian uh, assets on. Uh, uh, they transferred them from under management to to under super uh, under lock, but they didn't call it that. You know, they're not calling it frozen, but it, you can't access them. They're not frozen, but you can't access them. Now, sanctions are being threatened on El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. What was those, those, those three small banana republics, right? Remember the old days, banana republics? What do they mean? Well, it means one, some of these large, you know, United Fruit Company, they own the place. That, that's why they were called banana republics. They're little, little places. You know, well, they're being threatened with sanctions. What for? Uh, uh, because they're, they're, they're canceling their recognition of Taiwan and um, uh, starting uh, their recognition of China. And, the, and that's the pre pre precondition for them to be uh, available to have Chinese investment in developing the rail and developing the infrastructure. And they're all saying yes. We want to do that. So the U.S. is going to sanction them for that. But the U.S. doesn't recognize Taiwan, so what's the issue? Well, the issue is China's coming in. And they don't want China to come in because that's part of the Belt and Road. Now, uh, into Central America. That's, that's an invasion of U.S. United Fruit Company territory. <laughs> or whatever. So, so, but however, on the other side of, of the process, it's the same process, but you have two sides to the process. On the other side of the process, you have all 55 heads of state of Africa, 55 heads of state. Well, that includes those little states within South Africa. That, that they, they are even sending their head of state to Beijing to meet with Xi. 55 of them. They're meeting next week, weekend. 55, they're all going to be there. We're all going to be there to meet with G about what? About how we're going to develop all of Africa. When have you ever heard anything like that before? That is, oh no, no you're just going to go visit, you know, China and, 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 and ride the train, you know. You know, the old days, they used to go visit and get wine and dine and all of that, but they wouldn't get anything. Now, at the same time, you have a lot of motion by Russia, India, Iran, probably Pakistan and China to kind of get this thing in, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan kind of uh, settled out. The idea is to bring the, the Northern Alliance apparatus of the Tajiks and the, and the, and the uh, Uzbeks to work with the Taliban creating some kind of some kind of end to the conflict. And of course, this is a very big threat. Why is this a very big threat? Well, what's going on up there? Well, partly because of the Belt and Road, of course. But the Taliban, in conjunction with all these other nations, of conjunction with whoever joins them in the coalition government, may wipe out the poppy fields. They may shut down the opium. My God, what are we going to do if that happens? And that is a key part of the system, of the, of the, of the uh, city of London dollar system. Can you imagine all that opium being, being shut down? That, that's not going to help, you know, the banking system. So, so that's, what's on, that's, what's, that's what peace means in... Afghanistan, it means potential end, it means establishment of, 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 of government that can run that place, and it means a potential end to the opium trade, uh, a potential, you know, so that's another thing. Now, okay, now, meanwhile, uh, Meanwhile, massive financial warfare is also being run against the, 
the currencies of these nations with the intention of destabilizing internally these nations with something that has been used before called capital flight. Okay. Whenever the international financial system of the offshore system of the City of London and Wall Street decide it's time to put a little heat on some of these countries to let them know who's boss, there's financial warfare. And then there's massive capital flight leaving those countries. That's what happened to Mexico. That's why the Russians called in by Portillo to meet with Portillo because, you know, Mexico had its immense development plan going into the 70s, late 70s, and bang, all this capital flight started to happen, especially when Volcker raised the interest rates to 20-some percent or 18, 19, 20 percent. You had massive capital flight. Mexico, it totally destabilized Mexico. Portillo, as his, administ as his time and as president was ending, had to nationalize the banks, but that wasn't enough. He, that was his response. That's what LaRouche advised him to do. He did what LaRouche advised him to do, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. And also, uh, and so you have, so how does this work? The Federal Reserve increased, started increasing the interest rates. And that in combination, in coordination with uh, hedge fund, massive hedge, hedge fund operations against these currencies has caused the collapse of these currencies. The Turkey, the Turkish currency has collapsed 40%, the Argentine currency has collapsed 46%, the Brazil in, uh, and, and, and South African currencies have collapsed 20%, Russia's currency, I believe, has collapsed 20-some percent, China and India and Indonesia's currencies have collapsed 10%. How does this work? Well, you have all these, uh, you have what's called the emerging market uh, carry trade. An emerging market carry trade is that you get low interest money in dollar terms from the Fed or low interest European money from the European Central Bank and then you go and invest in government bonds in these countries which have a higher yield, much higher yield. And that's called the carry trade. And then, <coughs> and then But what the reverse of that is when you raise the interest rates, then their, their currency collapses and their ability to pay back these, these debts increases. And what happens at a certain point is that the, the, the central government has to decide whether to pay back these debts or starve their people. And what they end up doing is having the, the political capability to starve these people isn't there. So they end up having to, uh, to have a sovereign default. And this is what happened in Greece. This is what the whole Greek crisis was about. And similarly, this is what the 97, 98 Asian flu was about. The same kind of thing. So, so, so they're trying this trick on Turkey, on Argentina, on Brazil, on these other countries. And the idea is when you get to a certain point of sovereign default, like Argentina is right now, you go to the bankers. You go to the IMF and say, we're about to have a sovereign default, which means everything goes, that means we have no credit, we have nothing, we're no longer credit worthy, we have nothing, what can you do? And they'll say, well, we'll put together a bailout package for you. But there are going to be conditions. You all heard this many, many, many times ago. We have a bailout package for you. This is the whole thing with Argentina. Macri is being told to go to, Ar to New York, or his top people are going to New York. Okay, so, so this is also what's being done to Turkey. And so the idea is to for, uh, force these governments into submission. And this guy who is the guru of emerging market investments, uh, Jim O'Neill, the Baron O'Neill, O'Neill Baron of something or other, who was, did manage all the uh, um, assets of, 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 of Goldman Sachs at one time and was in the British government for a while. He's saying the markets are going to punish Turkey because Erdogan has been too nationalistic. He has tried to develop. In other words, if you try to develop, then you're, not, you're being too nationalistic. 
You're not obeying the market. The market doesn't want you to develop, and if you try to develop, you will be punished by the market. That is the system. So, uh, however, we're in a different situation now. The same thing has been tried on, on, on Russia. Collapse the ruble, collapse the ruble, collapse the ruble, and everybody's screaming to, to Putin. Why don't you do something? The ruble's being destroyed. The, all, you know, the oligarchs, they're, they don't give a crap about Russia. Why aren't you doing something? And, and Putin says, no, no, we're, we're, you know, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to live through it. We're going we're to get by, okay? Well, you know, Putin didn't want, didn't, doesn't want to go into open warfare with the, with, with the international, with the system. He doesn't want to go at, at that point. At that point, he didn't want to go into open warfare with the city of London directly. For many reasons, for whatever reasons, for his strategic uh, reasons, he didn't want to do it at that time. However, this is getting kind of serious. He had a meeting with Merkel, and Merkel and him were talking about Nord Stream. Germany needs Nord Stream to survive at this point. The U.S. is threatening Germany and telling Germany to cancel Nord Stream. So it's kind of hairy right now. It's getting kind of hairy. Pompeo was asked, well, what about China and when, when the sanctions go into effect against those countries which are doing trade with Iran? Is, what are you going to, you're going to sanction China? And Pompeo said, yeah. No, he's not going to sanction China. That would, be, that would blow up the United States. But that's the kind of brinksmanship that's going on. That's the kind of stress that's going on, the pressure that's going on. And that's stupid. And I think, I think they're kicking after the election. I'm not sure. But that's the kind of financial economic warfare that's going on. So, uh, however, despite that this kind of activity, is, which is raising the dollar by capital flight out of these nations, and because of the sovereign defaults, if you have sovereign defaults and nobody goes for a bailout package, then the whole banking system goes. That, that's the whole point about a sovereign default. If those bonds are not worth anything, then, and it's massive, it's on a huge scale like that, then that's when the financial system goes. But they're always counting on people bending and, and capitulating and eventually, uh, you know, they'll accept the austerity or the change or whatever. So it's a form of brinksmanship that's being played right here. However, it's a little different now. It ain't Greece. This is big. And there is a rebellion ruling. This is not necessarily going to go that route. Okay? This is not necessarily going to go that route. And uh, so in the middle of this, Russia, yesterday, I believe, number two, Ryabkov, in the foreign ministry, announced the following. Now listen very carefully. The time has come when we need to go from words to actions and get rid of the dollar as a means of mutual settlement <laughs> and look for alternatives. That's serious. This is coming from, no, it's not coming from Lavrov because he has to meet with uh, Pompeo, but it's coming from the number two. Okay. And uh, let me continue. We must take retaliatory measures, considering the logic and mentality that exists. We should not leave these sanctions, that, the, the sanctions of the U.S., unanswered. The hotheads in Washington would view a lack of response by Russia as a sign of weakness 
and would escalate. Okay. That's serious. That's the Russian response to all of this. The Russian response is not to put this and that and say this and that. They're talking about action now. Now, at the same time, the Central Bank of Russia is talking about imposing capital controls by forcing the major foreign banks in Russia to not be able to send more than 20% of their deposit capital outside of Russia. The way it works now is all the major banks, Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank, Goldman Sachs, all of the major 15 banks in the world have their branches in Russia. They're doing business in Russia. Russians are coming in to put their money in. In fact, this is how most of the capital flight occurs. You put your money in those banks and the, and the money uses the money somewhere else, not in Russia. And what, what they're about to do is to slap on, you can only take 20% of the capital that's in your Russian a branch out of Russia because they're trying to they're trying to create a, a capital flight operation and all these banks have gone oh you can't do that that's not fair and they are protesting profusely about the possibility that this is going to happen so 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 what this poses is what Ryabkov said is the question of alternatives. And alternatives would, on a, on a temporary scale, would be doing business uh, through currency exchanges between the countries that are doing business. But that essentially cuts, cuts off those parts of the world which are doing trade like that from those parts of the world, like the United States and Europe, the European countries, which have still more developed economies, from having access to, to trade with those. You still have to use dollars or euros uh, in, in that situation. So this is, this is causing, this is also something that can further the, the collapse of the financial system. If you start not, if you're not using dollars, and and you're using currencies that, currency swaps, where where you're not, there's no the, the speculators can't can't control the value, so so you're using X amount of currencies with other X amount of currencies, the speculators don't control that. So, it is in this context that we are. Mobilizing. So this is the context in which we are mobilizing for a new financial architecture, a, um, a new Bretton Woods, which, which will require two, the four most uh, influential nations in the world to actually set, set that up. And setting that, once they, are, once they have an agreement in an emergency to do that, then that sets up the framework for, for trade without speculation. Trade without, uh, with no it sets up a system where each national currency has a fixed relationship. And therefore you just do trade in, in, your, in your currencies. You don't have to go through a dollar. You don't have to go through a euro. Yeah, the euro, if, if the European Union is still in place, well they can use euros. If the US is still in place, they can use dollars. But there isn't a, an international dollar system controlled offshore and secrecy jurisdictions. And this is really what, what FDR set up in, essentially after the war. And this is what was taken down. And this is what LaRouche had Clinton talking about at the time that Monica Lewinsky appeared. So this is not a new idea. This has been percolating for over 20 years. Uh, actually 25 years. In, 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 in this form. And that's always been there. It's always been... Now, the difference between then and now, one of the differences between then and now is you have the Belt and Road, which allows for the expansion of trade and development outside of the dollar system. But we want to 
do it. We want to expand that. So now, so that's where the petition comes in that we're circulating. And mainly to get the discussion going everywhere in the world that you need a new financial architecture. Now, having completed that part of the presentation, I'm now going to the more painful part of the presentation, which is the subjective issue of the state of the mind of the oligarchy. Okay, now, now, look at this from an oligarchical standpoint, but I don't mean a, a rich person's standpoint. I don't mean the standpoint of somebody very rich. No. So I want to deal with the subjective issue of the state of mind of the European oligarchy behind this present crisis. And it's primarily a European oligarchy. And this is not going to be pleasant. It is important for us to get an idea of the subjective state of mind of our enemy. And how they are how you can expect that they will respond to all of this. First of all, the first thing you need to know is that we, the human race, from their standpoint, is the enemy. We are the enemy, the human race. For thousands of years, this European elite has continued from one generation to another through bloodlines connected to continued financial relations. Uh, and they consider themselves an aristocracy. They are not commoners. They have a titles. You are by birth, they are by birth breeding. An exception. And they're not equal to us in any sense of the word. They are different. And not only are they not equal to us, but they own us. They own us. We are property, whether we realize it or don't realize it. We are considered property, even though they may not have a feudal serf, a feudal uh, title, or a slave system, or some, some other, you know, sweatshop, or whatever. They consider us property. And we are currently property that is not behaving properly. Okay? Not only are we property, but they have the right to dispose of us in whatever way they wish. It's their right. They can have us killed. They can have us all warring each other. Okay? To be used in any way that suits their fancy. It is their right, by whatever reason, birth, God, or whatever. And as long as mass poverty exists and lack of development, the masses can be controlled through all kinds of means, from controlling the access to communication, the creation of myths, the creation of wars based on myths, etc. To them, ultimately, the major enemy is science, technology, the development of manufacturers, which ultimately leads to the development of the individual, human being. So they have a, a cultural issue. Um, they are in favor of promoting every kind of degeneracy that they can in the population for, for as far as they can promote it. That doesn't mean that they necessarily themselves indulge in this, but they feel it is their right to do so if they want to. The oligarchy loves a culture where every kind of perversion is rampant and permitted because it expresses their own sense of being. That for them, everything is permitted. Child rape, child murder, 
That's okay. If it's not them. It's just an expression of a worldview against humanity in general. Mass murder is a sport. It can be fun to watch. All of the cultural degeneracy from the anti-classical romantic moves to the postmodernism to the ugliness of modern art and music um, is a reflection of their inner hatred of beauty. Their inner hatred of being, uh, their inner being, of their inner sense of being of this aristocratic class, of the European aristocratic class. And they are rejecting any principle of humanity or principle of good. This is very important to understand the term, our values. Our values are the mirror of their values. When, when people talk about, when Obama talks about our values or Merkel talks about our values and everything that that represents from LBGTs to, to uh, you know, just every, every kind of wild thing that you can imagine. It's really a mirror of their values. Okay. All of this stuff is fine. George Soros' says open society is our values. That's what he means by open society. There's no nations. It's just an open society. Everything goes. There's no... There's no limitation on the perversions, on drug use, on anything, you know, whatever, the, whatever goes. That is our values. And that's what a large portion of the funds that come out of the city of London, uh, especially the drug trade, is put into George Soros' operations. What are George Soros' operations directed at in terms of cultural revolutions? It's against nations which are resistant to this culture. It is only a matter of freedom of taste and choice. And there's no, there's no principles involved in that. It's what you feel like, what you, what you prefer what, at that moment. There is no lawfulness to beauty or your, your, or your choice. However, anyone who seeks to promote development and nurture in the family and and development of science is to be attacked as the threat. They are intolerant. They are intolerant of perversion. They are intolerant of this our values. And a significant and let me tell you something. The U.S. population, a large portion of the U.S. population, is very messed up. They've been very brutalized, but they haven't given up their hatred for this culture. They may not understand anything, but they have a visceral hatred of this culture, and that's what, that's what um, resulted in Trump's election. And they know that. And it's not just Trump. It's those people in the United States, those deplorables, those low-class beings, those people that are dumber than rocks, who reject our values. That's what freaks them out. And that is an instinctive Promethean American impulse that exists historically in the United States. It also exists, it even exists in Great Britain with the Brexit. It takes different manifestations. It's right now in Hungary, it's, it, it's, it's asserting themselves. In other parts of the world, it's, it's asserting themselves. Where people have been brutalized by this our values. And these oligarchs have been poisoning the world for thousands of years, promoting their values. And as the Belt and Road and LaRouche's ideas, represented by China, and the emergence of a sovereign nation based, economic, uh, based on economic development of trade and credit, is now indicated by th this, this situation I described before. So, to the subjective mindset of the oligarchy, we now must turn. And I don't know how to get this across to people. 
Because you're not an oligarch. You don't think like an oligarch. You don't think like an aristocrat. That's not the way you think. Nobody in this room has a clue to how these oligarchs think necessarily, subjectively. It just seems very odd, very strange, very weird. Yet look at all the weirdness that's being generated out of their, out of their, out of their, out of what they do. So I'm going to refer to two examples, but these examples are not good examples. But they might give you an inkling as to how of the kind of problem we have. The first example is Hamlet. Okay, Hamlet in the play by Shakespeare is not the king. And the question people have is why is Hamlet not the king? And everyone who watches the play from an Elizabethan audience perspective suspects that the king's younger brother had, an, had his father killed and married his mother. That's what everybody would assume who watched the play if they were watching the play back in the Elizabethan time, because Hamlet's not the king. And then, and then, and then Denmark is facing an, uh, an invasion from Norway. And you find this out in the beginning of the play. So the question is, what is Hamlet doing? What is Hamlet doing? Is it, what's he doing? Is he going to kill the king? Is he going to take, take power, as he should? and kill his mother along with the king, and take power and rally the nation. No. And he has a soliloquy where he says, to, to be this or that, to be what I have to be to wage a war against the sea of troubles, or to be who I, am, who I know myself to be now, knowing that I'm going to die if I, if I continue as I am. So what's so bad about that? In other words, he's saying in the soliloquy that he would rather die than change the section. Now, applying this to the oligarchy, would they be willing as an oligarchy to accept a world in which they were on an equal par with the rest of humanity? and their children would be on an equal par with the rest of humanity. Would they be willing to accept? They could live in absolute luxury. They could live in a world, a beautiful world. But would they want to do that? Would they want to be able, would they be willing to do that? Would they be willing to do that even though if they did, weren't willing to do that and know very well that they're going to die, would they be willing to do that? And I will tell you, I don't think so. That's the problem we have. That's why it's a very dangerous situation. Because in their mind, as far as I can tell, they don't want to go, they don't want this world to come into being. They don't want to live in that world. And they would rather kill every human being on this planet, including themselves, than, than have that world come into being. Now that might be an extreme statement, but I have a suspicion that that's what, that's what the inner, in a sense of, of identity. Now the other example I want, I want to touch on, which also is not a very good example, but in the south of the United States during uh, the period of slavery, when slavery was very big, the plantation owners aspired to be the equivalent of the European aristocracy. And, um, and I want to focus on a, on a particular hamlet by the name of Robert E. Lee. Uh, at the time that uh, Lincoln won the election and the Civil War began, um, the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, General Winfield Scott, basically handed the thing over to Robert E. Lee because he was the next in line. And no one's denying his competence, military competence, although some people might. The point is, is that he had a choice of doing what had to be done to preserve the Union, for which 
and the constitution for which he had pledged his allegiance to, he said, I can't go against my Virginia. My, I can't go against Virginia. I can't go against our values. I can't go against our way of life. Well, what is that way of life? The plantation system. That's his way of life. And he's a part of that system. And he would rather lead the Confederate forces to preserve that way of life than, say, be, be part of the Union. Now, that's not a very good example of an old, but it has an oligarchical aspect to it. So, 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 this is about now, what I'm telling you now is about the situation in the United States, the fight that's going on in the United States right now. It's this. Will this European aristocracy and their influence in the United States succeed in controlling the United States to the effect that the armament, the nuclear armament and military capabilities of the United States will be used to bring down the human race. That's the essence of how I see this issue. And if you understand that, then it's a very freaky experience, but it's also at the center of the fight that's going on in the United States. And so, and from that standpoint, the significance of the midterm election 73 days from now or so have very special significance. We're not talking about Donald Trump being perfect in any way. The forces that are going after him are very, very, are being unleashed. And the, 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 the hysteria and hate mongering that's going on is absolutely uh, great. And so, this election has that quality to it. And I'm very concerned about it. And th there is no other way but to win that, to, to, to defeat. We won't win it necessarily if the, if the Republican Congress stays in place. But that opens the door to defeating the forces in the United States that represent our values that represent this uh, corruption. And the center of that corruption is the Justice Department of the United States. That is the center of the corruption in the United States. It, it's also in the media, it's also in the culture, but this, the operational center of that, of that, um, of that is, in, is in the Justice Department. And um, so in the last few days, we've seen a massive escalation. And I watched part of Barbara Boyd's presentation, which you can get on YouTube, on the Manhattan. Uh, they don't show the Manhattan thing live. You have to get it on YouTube. Barbara Boyd's presentation uh, is very good at giving you a sense of, of, of the, the mechanics of this situation with the Justice Department. And she compares what happened to LaRouche to what happened, what's happening now to, uh, um, to Donald Trump. She goes through it because she was on the, she's, on, she's been on, on the inside of this. And she does a very good job. And, and uh, uh, however, as they deploy to destroy Trump, they open up. and show themselves, reveal themselves, and they open themselves up for counterattack. And already, you see the beginnings of Trump organizing a counterattack. He is threatening to the class of, now he's threatening to fire um, of, uh, Sessions and, all, and the whole crowd. He's threatening to declassify the documents. And already this battle is, is, is escalating. But for the first time, in my knowledge, everything that we have said about all of this is now coming out in the open. It's now coming out in the open. And without this apparatus in the United States, centered in the Justice Department, 
you cannot control the domestic situation in the United States. And if you cannot control the domestic situation in the United States, you do not have the military at the disposal of the city of London. You do not have the nuclear weapons at the disposal of the city of London. But it's the Justice Department which controls the domestic situation in the U.S. Um, so, now why is everybody freaking out about Donald Trump? Why are they freaking out about Donald Trump? Okay. Trump deranged. Huh? Trump deranged. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The people who have accepted these our values as their values, whether it's you know there's too many people on the planet and we got to get rid of them and you know global you know carbon dioxide and all of that is one aspect of it, and or whether even more profoundly the the cultural and um, postmodernist view that man is evil and, 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 and man is no good and man has no reason and it's just your, your, your opinion versus mine, your race versus mine, your sex versus mine. Those, that culture is very pessimistic. And I consider the people that, most of the people who have accepted that culture are also people in non-blue collar occupations that have relatively decent salaries. And these people have assimilated the culture of the master, you might say, of the masters of the house. And they see, and what's happening is that their, their submission to that culture is being challenged by, by Donald Trump. And they're freaking out. Because he's going out there and addressing, in very simple words, the deplorables. And he's getting a reaction from them. He's, and they're freaking out. They're freaking out. And they're going crazy. And you have people who, who have fallen for one aspect of this modern culture or another. The, the people that Trump is mobilizing don't have the, the wherewithal to even, to even be in this modern culture. They're in a different culture. They're in a different culture. They, they're in a much more basic culture. And they reject instinctively the culture that, that, that uh, uh, you know, this culture. And some people call these people racist. And many of them are racist. And some people call this them religious fanatics, and many of them are religious fanatics. But on a deeper level, they reject culture, this culture. And so, so this is what, what, what's happening. And, um, and Trump asserted something. He said, we're going to make America great again. We're going to develop, rebuild America. We're going to, you know, those are just words. Okay? We're going to rebuild America. We're going to build infrastructure, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That caused an instant hatred of reaction against it. How dare you? America isn't worth it. America is evil. So you have those leftists and socialists saying he is a fascist, he is a Hitler because he wants to make America great again. We, America shouldn't be great again. America is evil. America should be destroyed. American industrial development has hurt the world. You have that entire crowd saying that to them. Okay? How dare he say that? And you have also asserting the principle of, 
of our optimism about the future of the United States. Well, he, oh, the, the economy's never been greater. Well, that's a lie. Trump is lying. Right? Well, no, he's, he is lying. But he's saying that. He's, he's projecting his optimism. And, you know, the point is that they hate that. They hate that. And I saw, I've seen it with my own eyes. And I'm going to now do a little anecdotal, uh, anecdotal um, thing. I have been, um, I have gone out on the street in areas of Seattle where you have a kind of retired middle class, uh, working class, you know, not, not rural, not rural, not like, you know, you know, toting guns and all of that, but, but more, more, you know, educated, skilled worker, retired areas, and uh, in also working class areas. And, and we have an incredible reaction from the population. Uh, in both times I've been out in the last two weeks, the two-person squad with the table with a sign saying Trump can't do it alone and other signs. We got a whole bunch of memberships. We, we raised about $350 on, on each squad, or average. One, one claimed close to $400. One was about $350. And these people were not familiar. Well, some of them were familiar with LaRouche, but they were, you know, they were like, they wanted a fight. And they were happy to see us out there. And they were happy that somebody had the courage to come out and, and present themselves. Because the media has created an environment where if you like, if you don't come out attacking Trump at your workplace, then you're targeted. So this is an environment. So you have this fear environment. You're going to lose your job. If you're a blue collar worker, well, that's not the case because it's not like that. But if you're in an environment like a city city employee or you work in a, a certain company and you know so on and so forth, so people are very cautious. So they see us and they react. And um, so I've never seen anything like this. And then the anti-Trump people come up screaming using the most foul epithets you can know the man, um, calling us crotch grabbers and uh, calling us uh, everything under the sun. And one guy came up to me. He was a little older than me. You could tell he was kind of a leftist, a socialist, and he had a ponytail. And what he said to me was this. He said, I'm an American patriot. Donald Trump is a traitor. Mueller is a hero, you know, from the Marines. And I looked at him. And I'm a veteran. And I told him, well, did you think Vietnam was a just war? No. But that's another issue. I said, well, then why are you supporting us going to war? And then he stopped. And he was confused. He was confused. He, was got, he got angry, flustered, and he was confused. In other words, he was reacting to the media, but he was, he was this, is, this, is a, this is a textbook case of, of cognitive dissonance in, 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 in his mind. He was all whipped up with no idea of, 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 of the context, what have you. It doesn't help that the American people don't have any idea of the Belt and Road from the media. It's only through us and, and, and other people that, you know, it's only through our organizing that people have been finding out. And, 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 and unfortunately, that's part of the problem. But this is what's going on in the United States. The Rasmussen poll, now this is very interesting, the Rasmussen poll did a poll of the African American community. The media is screaming that Trump is KKK, Trump is a racist, Trump is this, Trump is that. 36% of African Americans support Trump. What's that about? Well, I know what it's about. It's the cultural divide. There is 36% of African Americans are not part of the, this our values culture. They have the earlier 
traditional African-American Christian culture of values of King, even though it's not as, it's still there in a lot of these people. And they don't like, you know, they don't like the, the, the our values culture. But nobody's saying that. That's not public. It came out in the, it, uh, this is my uh, hypothesis. And then uh, there was an interview, I saw a five minute interview uh, with the leading African American intellectual of of uh, the United States, or at least the person considered to be the leading, uh, Cornell uh, West. And all he could say is that Trump is a racist, that this is a disease in the United States, Trump is a manifestation of that disease. I'm not giving the correct phrase, but I'm just what I'm saying, the gist of what he was saying. And Brother Mueller is about to meet Brother Trump. In other words, he was absolutely ecstatic that Trump was going to go down. And Brother Mueller was going to take out Trump. And does Corn Cornell Wallace, I mean, does Cornell West know that the FBI killed, um, most likely killed Dr. King? And Malcolm X. And Malcolm X. Yes, of course he does. He's a very intelligent person. He, he helped Obama get elected, and then he broke with Obama over, over the fact that Obama went with the system. Cornell West knows what the system is. He understands what the system is. We've been at his, at his, his presentations. He, other people have attacked LaRouche, but he won't attack LaRouche. We, I, we've actually confronted him with uh, our ideas, Glass-Steagall, all of this stuff. He has never opposed what we're saying. He kind of agreed. So what's going on here with him? What is happening to him? Well, something deep is going on in this guy because he has no reason. He has nothing. To, nothing. He has no stake. Now, there was another. There's another African American leader, not an, not the so-called academic intellectual, but a real African American leader who worked with King. Um, he was mayor of Atlanta, Andrew Young. He didn't attack Trump. He said, why are you attacking the people who voted for Trump? You know, you're, you're just making things worse. So, this, so there's a difference. There's a difference in culture. The our values crowd versus the more, the more traditional values crowd, even is represented in the African-American community. Now how does this relate to Canada? And that's where I, I want to pose the question. Um, I have some views about this and they're probably not correct, but I'm going to say, say them anyhow. The policy, this, the city of London crowd of promoting in Canada is contingent on Trump being dumped. Okay, Trump being dumped. If Trump survives and the Congress stays, does not impeach, and Trump is allowed to clean up the Justice Department in the United States, and is allowed to get a cabinet that will function, then everything in Canada is going, in my view, is going to shift. Why? Because right now, Canada's role internationally with Christina Freeland as Minister of Everything is to try to hold the our values line while Trump is being removed. If Trump is not removed, and the, the deep state in the U.S. is crushed, then everything changes in Canada. All the people in Canada, in the political system, who do not like what they're going through, will surface, or have the potential to surface. And in my view, 
We need to be there for them. 